Greetings to those who watch below. After having so much fun with the previous video, I've decided that it's time for another roundup of some true, terrifying Skinwalker stories. But first, let's give a big shout out and thank you to Steffi Ray, Lisa Watts, Lefty Kim, and Ghost City Shelton, those who dwell below. If you'd like to join them, make sure to check out the link in the description box. Mine and my father's Skinwalker Experience by Neptune420 My father owns a small delivery service that operates out of Farmington, New Mexico. We mostly deliver small packages out to the middle of nowhere that are too much of a hassle for the larger delivery companies to bother with. My dad is the only employee and we have a few pickup trucks and a trailer. One day, we get a delivery out to Window Rock, Arizona on the Navajo Reservation about two hours from Farmington. My dad gets the call for the job while he's chilling with his Navajo friend, Travis, and his girlfriend. Travis mentions how he's got family in Window Rock that he hasn't seen in ages, and suggests they go with him. I was about six or seven at the time, and it was summertime, so dad decides we'll all go down together. He can do his delivery really quick. Then, while Travis sees his family, we can go check out the Window Rock, which is a big rock face with a large hole in it that goes to the other side. We had to convoy in separate trucks, since my dad's was loaded down with freight. We decided to bring along some walkie-talkies so we could communicate with one another. We spend our time in Window Rock, everything is generally uneventful, and we start heading home along the old highway with my dad and I in front and Travis and his girlfriend in their truck behind us. I honestly don't remember most of the Window Rock trip, but this next part I can never forget. We're somewhere on the highway between Window Rock and Gallup. It had just rained earlier in the day, and the road was kind of slick, so we were taking it pretty slow. On the left of the highway, there's nothing but sandstone cliffs, and on the right, there's a huge field, separated from the road by a small barbed wire fence. We crest the top of this hill, and down at the bottom of the hill, we see what appears to be a very large dog, sitting back on its haunches in the middle of the road, facing the cliffs. My dad calls over the radio, Hey Trav, do you see that big ass dog? Travis starts yelling back over the radio, That is not a dog! Speed up right now and hit it! His voice sounds almost hysterical. He just keeps screaming, Hit it! You have to hit it, JJ! Please, please hit that fucking thing right now! So, my dad starts to speed up, and as we get a bit closer, I can begin to see it a little more clearly. It's covered in this brown, wiry, matted hair that appears to have dried blood all over it. It's still facing the cliffs, but the moment our headlights hit it, it turns and looks at us, and it has a face. I don't know how else to describe it, other than a mix between a bear's and a human's face. It looks twisted and distorted and almost in pain. As we get close to this thing, we start to realise it's actually fucking huge. Though it's still sitting on its haunches, it's about shoulder height with the hood of the truck. We get literally inches from hitting it when it lets out this scream that sounds like someone screaming as their lungs were filling with water, and it leaps backwards, towards the field, landing just on our side of the barbed wire fence. Then, with another leap, it was gone from sight. Travis comes over the radio again, Holy shit. Keep driving. We gotta get out of here. We have to go faster. He keeps repeating the last part. We have to get out of here, and we have to go faster. Pretty soon, we're speeding like crazy, and just as we start to come near the outskirts of Gallup, we get pulled over. Travis pulls his truck over with us. Naturally, this makes the cop, a Navajo man himself, very on edge, and he immediately asks why Travis felt the need to pull over as well. Travis says, we just saw a skinwalker a few miles back, and it's been following us. The officer immediately turns white, stammers something about a verbal warning, gets in his car, and takes off. We do the same. We didn't see anything else that night, but when we got home, Travis refused to leave us without taking some kind of Navajo totem thing that's supposed to keep it away. Armadillos, fire ants, barbecue, 
and a skinwalker by Off Topic Bear. It was 1995, I had just graduated high school, an old friend who I hadn't talked to in seven years and I were hanging out, and I said, let's go to New Orleans, and we did. We had $140 between us, and back then that was more than enough. We made it to New Orleans, almost died from culture shock, and turned around and headed to Magnolia to get some sleep. We stayed at Magnolia Inn. It was a shithole, but it was nice and cool. It was May or June in South Mississippi. Cool was the only adjective that mattered. We stayed up that night playing poker, drinking Gordon's vodka, and talking about who knows what. Probably girls, college, and college girls. At some point I said, you have been to Texas? No. Nope. Well, pack your bag, let's roll. We had a road atlas. Marshall, Texas was right across the border from Shreveport. We arrived in Shreveport, made a phone call to another friend, who we were actually supposed to be staying with. Both our mothers had called looking for us. The only person that knew where we were was the buddy on the phone. It was no big deal. We'd be home in a day or two. Before we left that rest area in Shreveport where we made the call, we saw an armadillo. Let me tell you something about armadillos. Those bastards will hiss, jump, and turn into Tasmanian devils if you corner them. They can also carry leprosy. We were 18. We chased that armadillo around for an hour. Now let me tell you about Shreveport. I don't know how it is now, but in the summer of 1995, it looked and smelled like a place where oil and metal went to die. It was dirty. We crossed a bridge and saw people fishing a hundred yards from where a drainage pipe from a factory was spewing forth waste upriver from the fishermen. The locals reminded me of the locals in Adamsville. Bald-headed women and cross-eyed men. A lot of bald-headed, cross-eyed kids. I'm sorry, but it was a Rob Zombie movie to come to life. The best part of Shreveport was an armadillo that might possibly have leprosy. Marshall was 40 miles away. We rolled on. Marshall was a decent little town, home of the Fire Ant Festival. We stopped at a little barbecue joint and had a coke, a smile, and some pulled pork. It was getting late and the sun was setting. We looked at the map and decided to backtrack a bit and head up rural route 43 through Karnak and past Caddo Lake. We would eventually run into Highway 59, head to Texarkana, and then head back home. When we left the barbecue joint and headed towards 43, it was dusk. Highway 43 wasn't well lit. It was almost as dark as Natchez Trace Parkway. My friend was driving, and we were doing about 45. Any faster would have been reckless, even for a couple of 18-year-old dumbasses. The road was kind of like Christmasville Road. It was dark, winding, and full of hills that ended in curves. There were beady and glowing eyes on both sides of the road. You could hear the crickets and the bullfrogs over the sound of the wind rushing by that old centra. It was peaceful and creepy at the same time. The humidity was a real thing, tangible. The air was thick. It smelled like pastures, hay and swamp. We drove for what seemed like hours. It was after midnight, and I saw a sign that informed me that Bivens was the next town of any size. I was hypnotised by the yellow lines on the road. We hadn't seen another car in at least an hour. Sleepy, I rolled the window down and lit a cigarette. There was music coming from the radio. It was either Tupac or Bob Seger. I smoked my cigarette, absent-mindedly flicking ashes out the window. I took one last puff and flicked the camel short off into the woods. Then, I saw it. I never looked to my right. I didn't even kind of peek to the right. Maybe I did a little bit when I flicked the cigarette away, I don't know. What I do know is that in my periphery, there was something running alongside the car. It was just behind my window, behind where the edge of the door ends and before the back window begins. I looked over at the speedometer, 40 miles an hour. I looked to my friend, he was looking straight ahead. I looked straight ahead. I could still see it. I could see one huge arm, matted hair, reddish brown and sticky looking, primal. I eased my right hand over and rolled up my window. My friend was still looking straight ahead, his jaw was clenched, and he put both hands on the wheel and sped up. No words were said. I was looking straight ahead 
and still out of my periphery, I could see that arm moving, muscles and tendons visibly rippling beneath that matted hair. As the car gained a little speed, the thing running alongside us lost pace slightly. I then saw the hand on the end of that nightmarish arm. The hand was clenched into a fist the size of a cantaloupe. A big cantaloupe. It was covered in the same hair, but slightly darker around the fingers, like it was stained with something. Suddenly, the hand unclenched, and I saw the claws. Black as this damned after midnight Texas night. Those claws were at least two inches long, sharp like an animal's. This wasn't a hand so much, as it was the killing paw and claws of some beast whose only purpose was to kill and eat. I looked back at my friend, looked at the speedometer, 50 miles an hour. I looked straight ahead, it was still there. I lit another cigarette, didn't roll the window down, and simply said, shit. The music had stopped. I finally broke the silence and said, hey, do you, and before I could finish, my buddy said, I see it. I've been seeing it. I can't even see you, but I can see whatever the hell that shit is. How much do you see? More than I want to. Speed up, John. Just speed up. It can't keep up forever. I looked over. 55. Whatever was chasing us, silently, was starting to lag behind. I finally looked to my right, just a bit. Imagine the scary part of the movie, where you put your hands in front of your face but still peek through. In 37 years, I have two regrets. One is picking up my first cigarette, and the other is me looking to my right that night. The beast was huge. Its chest was above the top of the car, and all I could see was that matted reddish-brown hair. Then, it bent forward as it ran. I saw the face of this thing. All reality stopped. We were no longer driving down some country road in Texas. We were now trying to escape from the depths of a monster-inhabited hell. The thing's face is beyond my power to describe. It was evil. The eyes were black and the pupils red. It flashed its teeth at me in a snarl, yellow and huge. Saliva dripped from its mouth. It opened its eyes wide. It looked hungry and pissed off. Then, it opened its mouth. The skin pulled back until all you could see were black gums and yellow teeth. Immediately I could feel the car accelerate. Fucking hell, John, just go. I prayed. I cussed. I lit another cigarette. Then, like the sunshine breaking through the clouds, the road straightened out. Don't you slow down. We drove through Bivens, and we drove to Texarkana. Then, we drove home. We never said a word. It was years later, eleven to be exact, before we ever even talked about it again, and we didn't talk about it much. He said he'd never told anyone, and I hadn't either. I told the story a few years back for the first time while I was parked out on a gravel road, doing the things you do when you're parked on a gravel road with a good-looking woman. I told it a year or so ago to a couple of kids who wanted to hear a scary story while they sat around a campfire. They didn't sleep for a day or two, but they asked me a dozen more times to tell them the story. I never told anyone until now that I saw its face. I've been scared for my life exactly two times. Once was on that road, and once was looking at a grizzly bear in front of me, with a terminal velocity inducing drop to the side of me. Call it what you will, call it bullshit if you want, but look me in the eyes and let me tell you this story and you'll know. Never doubt that there are things in this world that defy explanation and logic. The boogeyman is real. Navajo Skinwalkers, a family experience. I was adopted into the Navajo family when I was no more than three months old, from Phoenix, Arizona, and lived in Arizona on the Navajo Res my entire life. I grew up and learned the language, even though I'm not even half or full. My family dealt with these things, called skinwalkers. My mum was born in the 1950s. When she was small, she said she used to play with her little cousin on the road, while her mother herded sheep with her brother, and her father left on the wagon to get water a few miles down. 
Her cousin's mother lived near her family, so they had company for the most part. Neighbours lived three miles west and four miles to the south. Interstate 40 was about 26 miles to the south as well. It was all dirt roads. The rural area they lived in was covered in forest, so there were lots of tall pines, cedar, and oak trees everywhere. It's a great place in Arizona. Not too far from the New Mexico border, and not too far from Window Rock. Playing by the abandoned dirt road, just the two of them, far, far away from the house and the main dirt road, past the large number of trees, having the most awesome time by themselves, just playing with their dolls. My mum smelled something like rotting meat, and heard a crunch of sticks and leaves behind her. She looked back towards the large pine tree that leaned. Under it sat a woman with waist-long dark hair, peppered with a little grey here and there, watching them as they played. She was wearing a load of sterling silver and turquoise jewellery, body painted with black grease that stunk, and wore a coyote pelt to cover herself. My mother said she couldn't move, and just stared at it, just as it stared back at her. By no means was this woman pretty in the least. She was demonic looking, with what could be described as bloodlust, as her eyes trailed back and forth between my mum and her little cousin. Her little cousin wasn't even aware of it yet. She was a ways up, playing in the mound of sand. Heart pumping, ears ringing, my mum said she was so scared. Her breath felt stolen, and the smell was so bad she was getting dizzy. Yet, she couldn't move. Finally, she started muttering to her cousin in Navajo. Vivian. Vivian, there's something under the tree. Viv, Vivian, there's something under the tree. Run. Vivian looked up and saw the lady. Screaming in terror, Vivian burst into tears as the lady watched them, smiling, raising a finger and beckoning them to come over. My mum grabbed Vivian and ran down toward the main road, just in time for my grandpa, who was coming back from getting water with the horse-drawn wagon. Dad, there's something sitting under the tree there! And her father got angry and started yelling at them. Why are you playing way the heck out here? Get in! It's probably just your imagination. He looked over. He saw it as the lady had gotten closer to them. That's a skinwalker. Come on. And they got back to the house. He went back with her older brothers, but never found it. My mum said she couldn't ever forget seeing that. It was a traumatic experience, just knowing what could have happened to them, if she got to them first. My second encounter with a skinwalker on Navajo land. So, I decided to join my bestie Karen for a three-day stay at her grandmother's place on the res. Her grandmother lives near a place called Tuba City, Arizona, in the middle of nowhere, but surrounded by rural homes. We go to college together, and I was kind of interested to know about Navajo tradition, and about the last experience with a skinwalker I had. The first day we stayed, it was pretty chill, nothing out of the ordinary, but then her grandma said that a stray dog came out of nowhere and wouldn't leave. To me, it did act kind of strange and was a bit ugly looking. It had a black shaggy coat and looked like a mix between a German Shepherd and a Lab. That night, we were watching a movie in the living room with the curtains wide open. Grandma was in the kitchen cooking dinner as we watched the film. Next to the window is a medium bookshelf where the DVDs are kept. Karen went to put back a DVD that we'd just watched, but she freaked out because that stray black dog was staring at us through the window, standing on top of the wood box outside. This isn't something that normal dogs do, from either my point of view or hers. Usually my dog, which is a house dog, scratches the door to be let in, whereas reservation dogs aren't house dogs, and dogs inside houses are frowned upon in Navajo tradition. The other dogs seem to stay away from it. Karen opened the door and yelled at it to get off the box. It ran off behind the shed. Another day we went to Tuba City to get some groceries, and came back to the house. The dog was nowhere to be seen, which was nothing unusual. Grandma went to visit some people, so it was just Karen and I. About five o'clock, we heard something trying to open the door. We both looked out, 
since there had been no car heard and no dogs barking. We looked out the living room window to the door, and there was the dog, trying to open the door with its paws. Two paws, wrapped around the brass doorknob, standing on its hind legs. I thought that was weird, but wasn't really freaked out. Karen was. She opened the door and chased it off. Grandma came back later, and Karen told her. Grandma didn't like what she heard. We got ready to sleep. We slept in the spare bedroom since it had two beds, and one window with the curtains opened a little. We turned off the light, but something sounded on top of the roof. It was a pitter-patter of footsteps and scratching sounds and panting. It was weird because the roof was way up there. At first we heard what sounded like barking, but as it grew louder, the other dogs seemed to be barking at something as well. All of a sudden, something was running around the house barking, and it was no dog. That I'm certain of. The barking sounded human. A deep male voice, barking, like it knew that we knew it wasn't a dog. Karen decided to open the curtains to look out. There was the stray dog on its hind legs, looking into our bedroom, but this time it stunk, and it had what I thought were two black holes in its neck. Another pair of eyes twinkled, and the paws were deformed-looking hands, with overgrown, somewhat thick and sharp fingernails. We both screamed and shut the curtains. Grandma came running to the door, and seeing it, the first thing she did was grab the ashes from the fireplace, load three bullets into the shotgun from under her bed, bless herself in Navajo, and went outside to shoot it, yelling in Navajo about how the thing wasn't welcome there, and to get the hell out of there, for it to go linger somewhere else. Both of them being traditional, the next day they called a medicine man to come over and put cedar in. He prayed over everyone with cedar smoke and an eagle feather, blessed the place, made us eat bitter herbs called eagle's gull, and gave me an arrowhead. Apparently, I needed to carry one for protection, and a little pouch called corn pollen. It seems to work pretty well. The medicine man said the dog was a skinwalker. The body of a stray dog made an illusion, so we wouldn't know it wasn't a real dog. He also said that skinwalkers tend to harm people by using some sort of human bone straw to spit at someone and get human bones into them. Doctors can't detect it, but the medicine man that day pulled a piece of human skull out of Grandma's right shoulder. It was about two inches long and one centimetre thick. It was real, because we watched it pull it out of her. That was intense. Hi guys, thank you so much for listening to today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like some more Skinwalker stories, please let me know, because the well's not dry yet. There's plenty out there. Also, maybe you want to hear about a different type of cryptid. If so, just let me know in the comments section. As always, like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. That way you'll know when the next video comes out. So, until next time, sleep tight.